the genetic finding that we've seen in this group um, and a little bit about kind of the background when it comes to doing genetic testing and how that's changed over time. And then we'll let uh, Dr. Abbott and Dr. Mealy um, talk about some of the, the findings with CBI and with the neuropsych testing that these patients have had. So I'll go ahead and get us started. I'm just gonna share my screen. Okay. There you go, one second here. There we go. All right, can everyone see the slides? Awesome. Okay, so I'm just gonna start us off, like I said, with a genetic summary of the patients that we've seen so far. So um, to date, we have seen 30 patients with different types of 8P changes. And as you can see, about half of them, <laughs> half of them at this point have inverted duplication deletion, deletion syndrome. Um, about a third of patients have deletions. Uh, we have three patients so far with duplications and then a couple that have sort of some different changes. So one of them has a mosaic ring eight that has some mosaic duplications. And then one has an unbalanced translocation that essentially gives them a terminal, uh, P-terminal deletion and a Q-terminal duplication. So they're kind of in their own category, but they have some similarities with them, um, with the patients with duplications. So this is just a breakdown of where the deletions are. You can see that um, most of them are on that P-terminal end um, with different sizes. So we have a few that have very similar sizes down here, um, and then patients with slightly larger deletions on the terminal end of, the, of P. Um, we have one patient with a teeny tiny little deletion um, in P23.1, and then a few that are in sort of different areas of the, of the P end of the chromosome. Uh, duplications, like I said, we only have a few so far and they are, they're pretty different from each other in terms of where those duplications are located. Um, you can just see where those, where those are here. We have one very small one over in the P23.1 region um, and then two that are a little bit closer to the middle of the chromosome. And then um, the patients that we've seen with 8P inversion duplication deletions, um, I think this is very similar to what's been seen in the group as a whole. Um, most of our patients have a very, very similar deletion on the end of the chromosome. And then we have patients with varying sizes of the duplications, but you can see again, they kind of cluster mm -hmm. um, similar sizes. And then there's a few with, with slightly smaller duplications. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Science to talk a little bit about how testing has changed over time. Um, so Dr. Science, if you're if you're on here, can't see everyone on my screen. So I don't know if Marga is with us, Katie. Huh. I think she was there with her I like saw, a second. Yeah. yeah, I wonder if she's still having some uh, technical Internet. difficulties. Yes, <laughs> yeah, she was on before for sure. Yeah, she was. Well, I can um I can kind of start with some some overall um, thoughts on genetic testing over time. So something we always share with patients and families is genetic testing is kind of like if you think about any technology, if you think about your cell phone or your computer, I mean, think how much that's changed just over the past 10 years, definitely the past 20, 30 years. Um, so genetic testing is the same. Um, so we've come a long way from being able to do kind of simple karyotypes where we see a picture of the chromosomes, we, the, the lab um, genome, the geneticists that do that testing can look and see are all of those bands. So, you know, all the bands that we see on the chromosome, are they all there? Are they what we expect to see? Is everything in the right place? Um, to having microarrays that let us define breakpoints of those deletions or duplications in a more precise way. Um, which is helpful for knowing the exact genetic content of deletions or duplications, knowing which genes are impacted. Um, if there's a gene right at a breakpoint that's being affected, that's really helpful for us to know. Um, and then genetic testing at this point includes everything from next generation sequencing panels that are looking at a you know, large number of genes at the same time. 
uh, to whole exome sequencing and whole genome sequencing. That's essentially looking at all of the genetic information um, to see if there are any single gene changes or many copy number variants can be detected on that type of testing with some limitations. This is just kind of uh, probably a, a diagram a lot of you a lot of you guys have seen over time. Um, just the the structure of what the cells look like, what the chromosomes look like. And then as you kind of zoom in further and further, um, what the actual individual, the genetic code and the individual genes. So the genes are made up of nucleotides. Um, these four kind of letters make up that DNA code. And then that's what's coded into proteins. This is again, kind of what a chromosome looks like with all of those banding patterns. So this is what um, lab geneticists are looking at when they look under a microscope to make sure that all of that content is there. Um, so we have the P arm, which is the smaller arm. So P stands for petite and um, Q is just the next letter in the alphabet. So that's how those, um, those arms are described. And this is what uh, genes look like kind of when you're, when, when the genetic code is translated into a protein, uh, the genes are made up of exons, which kind of get cut up and then put back together to build that final protein product. So there's um, information in between those exons called introns that kind of link everything together. It's what we used to call junk DNA um, 20 some years ago. We now know that that's not the case. There's a lot of important information within those introns. Um, and some of our patients um, with other conditions really have um, splice site mutations that can affect how those exons are kind of cut up and put back together. Um, this is just a representation of what a um, microarray can show and how, um, how the lab can detect whether there is the expected amount of genetic content at a certain location or if there's less material than expected, which would show us a deletion, more material than expected that would show us a duplication. Um, so it kind of shows up as all these little lights. Oh, sorry, I'm just like checking to see if Marg is here because I don't want to steal her thunder if she does hop on. Um, so this is how the lab can kind of look at um, a lot of genetic information at the same time. And this is sort of how next gen sequencing works that all of the DNA is sort of chopped up into little pieces and then put back together and lined up with the reference genome. And that's how the lab looks to see if there is anything that's extra or missing um, from what we would expect to see. Um, this is just kind of a description of whole exome sequencing versus whole genome sequencing. Um, we have sort of within the past couple, maybe two or three years started doing genome sequencing a little bit more frequently uh, from a clinical standpoint. Um, previously, it was more done on a research basis. Um, we are finding that at this point in time, there's not a huge um, increase in diagnostic yield doing genome versus doing exome. Um, there are certain types of changes that are a little bit easier to detect doing whole genome sequencing. Um, but most changes still at this point can be found on exome just as well as genome. Um, I think we're kind of at the point now that that's starting to shift and um, genome is becoming more and more useful um, as we're getting better at kind of utilizing the additional data that it gives us. So at this point in time, it has maybe a 7% increase in yield over exome sequencing. Um, Obviously, both of the tests are, they're very comprehensive. It takes a lot of a lot of technology and a lot of brain power to interpret findings on exome and genome. So it is a test that does take some time, um, especially in the interpretation part of the testing. And it is something that still costs a good amount of money. So it can be difficult sometimes to get um, for patients to have access to this testing or to get insurance to cover testing. Um, so that's something we're always we're always fighting with insurance companies on. There we go. Um, so really, the take home message for genetic testing is that testing is always changing and growing. Um, so we make sure when we see patients in our clinic, especially patients that were diagnosed many years ago and may have had 
um, you know, a more basic version or a more limited version of testing. Um, we have had some patients that we've done updated testing on just to get a more specific idea of where, you know, especially for our AP patients, where those breakpoints are, exactly what the genomic content is of the deletions and or the duplications, um, because that helps us to make some, you know, clinical recommendations. There are patients that have, for example, um, the GATA4 gene may or may not be included in their deletions or duplications, and that can um, impact our recommendations um, for cardiac care. So um, patients that have deletion of that gene can have an increased risk of cardiac malformations. So usually for patients that have um, that gene impacted, we'll recommend an echocardiogram. So that's kind of just one example of how updated genetic testing can help us to make clinical recommendations. I'm just trying to go quick so we have time for questions at the end. Um, so, you know, definitely feel free to interrupt any of us as we go along. Um, do we have Megan on here? Yes, I am here. <laughs> Perfect. All right, so I'll turn it over to Megan. Uh, yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Megan. I'm one of the epilepsy fellows here um, who also works in the clinic. Um, the AP heroes. Uh, sorry, I was a little bit late. We're just taking care of some sick kids in the hospital. So I was kind of trying to rush back over here. But um, I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about how we're evaluating kids in clinic and give kind of a high level view of an assessment we're using um, to evaluate kiddos. Um, and then also spend a little bit of time uh, looking at CBI. So um, in the clinic, we have been using a clinical severity assessment that was originally designed for um, another developmental epileptic encephalopathy called CDKL5. Um, so it's called the CDKL5 Clinical Severity Assessment. Um, and it's essentially a way to measure a structured neurologic clinical exam um, in a kind of measurable way that gives us some data we can use. And so I just wanted to give an example of what one of the items looks like in terms of gross motor function. So we would score kids on how their head control is with sitting, how they can go from lying to sitting, and so on forth. We have many items that go into the clinical severity assessment. And so just some like very high level view stats on how the clinical severity assessment has been looking in our AP population so far. So from a gross motor perspective, um, the AP kids tend to do very well. A grand majority of them can walk um, with or without um, limitations. So wide base or someone standing by to assist, but overall can walk independently. Uh, from a fine motor perspective, you know, over two thirds had at least an immature pincer grasp um, to use to pick up objects. And 44% of patients had consistent use of words or phrases, and that's either through a device or through gestures or through speech. So um, a lot of kids um, communicating in different ways. We also, in addition to the clinician clinical severity assessment, which is an exam we do in the clinic, um, have caregiver reports um, that are part of this clinical severity assessment. And so we've had 12 caregivers complete the clinical severity assessment survey um, for these kiddos. And so uh, about a quarter of kids reported having, their parents reported having one lifetime seizure and being on at least one anti-seizure medication. And the grand majority reported at least weekly therapies of all the different types of therapy. And I think the caregiver survey is really great at talking through kind of what is life like on a day-to-day -day basis and what is life like for these kids. And so we're able to pull out some of these functional results. Um, and once again, just kind of a high level view of um, some stats on what we're seeing thus far. And so um, I thought it was interesting that a grand majority reported some teeth grinding um, throughout the day and night. A lot of kids are struggling with constipation, although the majority are controlled with just diet and didn't require medication. And I thought this was amazing. All children are at least somewhat orally fed. So a minority are requiring some supplementation via G2, but everyone's able to eat um, some by mouth of the 12 who filled out the survey. And we see this a lot in all of our kind of genetic conditions that we're studying, but 50% reported reduced response to pain. Um, so not feeling pain as much as maybe um, other kids their age. 
And a lot of y'all are working on toilet training or fully toilet trained, which is amazing. Um, and I know it's such a challenge, um, especially in this population, but there's lots of kids working on it. And also 58% of children required attention during the night. Um, so if there's parents on that know that they're struggling during the night, you're not alone in that. Um, a lot of the kids um, required attention during the night. And so we're not just doing this with um, our 8P kiddos, we're also doing this with the other conditions we see in the clinic. So I just wanted to show you, this is some data I presented at AES this year, um, which is just you know how our numbers looking across the board of these conditions. And so the higher the score on the clinical severity assessment, the more severe um, we think things are. And so you can see 8P in blue um, and 8P tends to be kind of on the mild to moderate side of the clinician's severity assessment when you look at other conditions across the board. Um, and of course, these are still relatively low numbers. And then the caregiver score as well. Um, AP was on the more mild side in terms of functional impact um, and what caregivers are saying about their kids. Um, and I think some of that's attributed to kind of the lower seizure frequency also um, in AP compared to some of these other conditions, but definitely something we want to continue to look at. Can I ask a question? Yeah, absolutely. So for the uh, clinical symptoms that you were describing, the the constipation, the grasp, the, the language, um, have you correlated the answers to those questions with the particular AP alterations that the patients have? No, it's definitely something we want to do over time is see if we see kind of groups break out based on like inversion del dupe versus strictly deletions versus strictly duplications and does that change kind of the scores on these scales and that's absolutely work um, that is upcoming but not something i have right at this moment thank you yeah yeah and please everyone feel free to interrupt me as i go oh thanks can i just jump on the back of that do you normalize to age at all because obviously you wouldn't expect an 18 month you, you know to, to be writing how do you work with that Absolutely. So the item bank, essentially, there's ways to kind of opt in and out of items based on age. And so if an 18 month old can't score some of those higher items that are for the older ages, then it's just not included in the overall average of the score. Um, so we do have items that are appropriate per age of the, of the kid. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, okay, great. And I just I a, uh, wanted to look at the question. Yeah. And what you're presenting today, is this just the kids that you've seen in the clinic or are you pulling from the AP registry as well? This is just kids we've seen in the clinic because the clinician okay. clinical severity assessment is an in-person evaluation because we really need to have hands on the kiddo to do the exam and to score the items. And so at the moment, it's just the kids we've seen in the clinic. Okay. Um, so just, this is just showing different domains of both the clinician on the left and the caregiver on the right clinical severity assessment, um, with all of our disorders. And so 8P is in blue and it can just kind of show you the relative challenges that 8P is having in different domains. And so, like I said, the higher the score, the more severe the impairment. And so if for a motor score, we see that 8P kiddos have pretty significant impairment compared to the other domains, vision and communication. And we'll get into the vision domain in a little bit because I have some more breakdown of data of the visual scores in CVI. Um, and then the caregiver domain scores, we can see the AP kiddos don't tend to struggle with seizures as much as some of our other conditions, definitely have some behavior impact um, and some of our autonomic and alert features as well. Okay. Um, I'm also going fast to give time for everyone else who needs to present data, but any okay. other questions on the clinical severity assessment before I dive into CBI? I have a quick question. Um, what consideration is given to the fact that the kids who are probably more able to travel are making it to the clinic? Like we can't travel just because he's a 10 year, almost 10 year old in diapers. Yeah, no, I think that's, such an excellent point um, is kind of a sampling bias of who's getting to the clinic and how, you know, the more functionally impacted you are, the more difficult it might be to get to our clinic. And so I think 
a really great point and one we're going to kind of have to take into account. Um, I don't have a great way to like correct for it as of right now, um, other than maybe coming up with a way to do the clinical severity assessment over Zoom, although I think some features of the clinical severity assessment are, are very difficult to do from a virtual aspect. Yeah, but thanks for bringing that up. Um, I'll just add to that um, also is that's one assessment, right? And so there are others that might be better suited, which we're trying to incorporate um, through like the parent reported information that we're collecting in the natural history study or the registry that you guys have alluded to. So we'll try in a way to present more of a picture of, um, I think what Dr. Schultzer was also asking is like, you know, what are the phenotypes then based on the actual buckets of different AP rearrangements that we're seeing? And then actually to get even more precise, like what are some of the, you know, at some point the longer term goal is to say like there's specific genes that are related to these stronger phenotypes or symptoms and the, those that don't have those um, one copy of a certain group of, you know, driver genes, I'll just use the word genes right now, but we can get more specific, um, may not be as severe. And so we're trying to just collect data in many different ways. This is one way. 100%. I love that. Um, and so, yeah, and moving forward to talk about CVI, because I think CVI is going to be really important for AP. Um, and just show what we've been seeing in the clinic. So just like a brief overview, we don't have to take too much time, um, but CVI um, is technically defined as visual dysfunction um, by, uh, which is impairment in function of, um, you know, the processing of visual information despite intact ocular structure and function and is the leading cause of pediatric visual impairment in the U.S. Um, and is thought to affect much more children with developmental delay. And I think as I've div dived into CVI in general, I think it's very underrepresented in our kind of genetic populations that we're seeing in the clinic. And so just some common symptoms of CVI so that we know what we're talking about. Kiddos who struggle with cortical visual impairment um, have uh, increased attention to bright lights or certain colors like red. They've delayed visual responses and delayed tracking. A lot of times we'll ask questions in the clinic like, does your kiddo use their peripheral vision to reach for stuff instead of looking at an object and reaching for it? Um, difficulty with changes in surfaces. So going from wood to carpet um, or going to a stair, those are things that kids with CVI have trouble with and difficulty with busy visual environments. And I just wanted to say like one thing that we say as a spiel is, we know that our kiddos with um, AP related disorders have trouble processing information, right? Sensory processing has been known for a long time. And so I just think it makes sense that these kids are also struggling to process their visual environment. And so some questions that we ask, like I said, um, in our clinic visit is, do does family have concerns about vision? How is the patient looking at things? Are they using the peripheral vision? How are they going up and down stairs or crossing surfaces? And those are kind of just questions that peak our ears on if a kiddo has CVI. And then we also use the visual aspects of the uh, clinical severity assessment um, and have a visual domain that lets us know how severe visual impairment is. So. Just wanted to give um, the items that are part of the visual domain um, and then speak about some caveats before we get into scores. So we have fixing and following as an item. We have an OKN or an optokinetic nystagmus reflex, um, which essentially is black and white lines that go across the screen and your eyes have a natural response of tracking them. And if you have CVI, you might have a reduced or absent OKN. Um, and then how the eyes are aligning and how the eyes are moving. So roving eye movements, nystagmus, eye alignment, those things. Uh, and the caveat here is that these things are not necessarily just high in CVI, but if you have a structural ophthalmologic issue, these items could also be high. And so we have to take that into account when we're making our assessment. Um, in order to give a diagnosis of CVI in the clinic, we um, need a kiddo to have had an eye exam and have had their ocular structure 
you know, cleared from an ophthalmology standpoint before we would give a diagnosis of CVI. All right, so what have we seen in AP? Um, so of the 28 patients um, that we have assessments for, about 50% had or were given a diagnosis of CVI at the clinic. Um, and the average clinical severity assessment score in kids who had CVI was 28 versus the average visual score um, for those without CVI was 7.9. Like I said, a higher score indicates a higher impairment. And so this is uh, just a breakdown of all the kids who um, have CVI. So just to walk us through this graph, um, dark blue are the kids that had a diagnosis of CVI. So 13. Um, oh, thanks, Katie. I'm like waving my mouse like it's going to do anything. Um, and so these are kids that had scores of 11 or higher as well. Um, and so you can see that the majority, so four and four had, you know, low to moderate um, visual assessment scores when you look at the range of CVI, but a few kids had much higher scores just indicating more severe visual impairment. Um, and then the gray um, pieces of the pie are the kids who didn't have a diagnosis of CVI and had a score of less than 10. And this is what we've seen kind of across our disorders is that 10, the score of 10 tends to be the break point that um, if you get a score of above 10, most likely you're, you're going to have a clinical diagnosis of CVI, though the score itself cannot give a diagnosis of CVI. You need a clinician to make that assessment. I have a little bu bullet point at the bottom, um, which just relates to my previous caveat, which that there were a couple kids who had known underlying ocular abnormalities and so scored high on the visual assessment, but didn't qualify for a diagnosis of CVI. Um, so I didn't include them in the graph. So if the numbers are a little off, that's why. And then lastly, just wanted to look at how CVI looks um, across all of our conditions. And this is why I said um, that it was gonna be important for AP because AP seems to be one of our most impacted conditions for CVI. So um, about 50% of kids, like I said, with AP have a diagnosis of cortical visual impairment, um, similar to STXBP1 um, and potentially similar to ring 14, though I think we need to um, see more patients to make that percentage more accurate. Um, and SLC 6 second one seems less affected. And so it's just really important to know that AP, that in AP, that this is something um, that could be a struggle and to have um, providers, you know, willing to assess it and make a diagnosis. Lastly, um, just for the parents on the call, um, though I know this is a research meeting, um, just thinking about, okay, my child has a diagnosis of CBI, what do we do? Um, and so I think, a bullet point I don't have on here, though, is a teacher of the visually impaired. So I think it's just important that your school knows that um, you have a diagnosis of CVI and to make modifications. Some of those modifications can be to keep environment simple, to have high contrast. And if your child's using an AAC device to um, set it up with CVI in mind, so less choices, um, more high contrast on the device as well as their environment, and to have CVI incorporated into all their therapies. That's all I got. Any questions on CVI before we let Andrea take it away? Okay, I, I will take it away then. Thank you so much. Um, so what I wanted to present to the group is uh, how the neuropsych testing that I'm doing with a lot of the kids that we're seeing um, is kind of starting to shake out. Uh, and so um, that's what I'm happy to kind of start to tell you about today. Oh, thank you. So yeah, kind of like this 10,000 foot view. I'm gonna be talking to you about data specifically from the mostly the Mullen, a couple of Bailey scores are in there. Um, also the Vineland and then um, the Whipsy. Uh, and so um, a lot of you on this call might know this paper. Um, our fantastic special care physician, Dr. Santucci, put a um, message in the chat about this paper, um, which really puts together a ton of information, genotype to phenotype. And they actually do talk about um, the Vineland, which you can see on the next slide. 
Thank you. Okay, so this is like pasted from the paper. Um, so I won't read this to you, but this is kind of how they describe um, intellectual functioning and other abilities in their kids. Um, the one, so the very first part of the sentence, although intelligence quotients were not available, many not testable, is something that we are trying to, I don't want to say I take issue with that statement, but I um, I feel that it's true to get an, a, an actual IQ score on a gold standard intellectual um, test might not be possible, but it doesn't mean the kids are not testable. Every kiddo can show me something that they can do. And so I feel that it's important to give them the opportunity to show what they can do. And I feel like it's our job to figure out where that is um, and present them with as many options as possible. So it's true, it might not be, you know, a, a technical like IQ score, but there's still numbers that we can have and acquire from these kiddos, because they can sure show us a lot when you kind of ask for the information um, in the right way. Um, so anyway, um, the second paragraph just kind of talks about the Vineland. Um, as you can see where it says scores were 52, 66, 45, and 66. Um, so they kind of go through like this range of scores for their um, four groups. Um, and on the next slide, there's a picture of that. Thanks, Katie. So this is from that paper. And again, so I, I love the fact that they actually like included the Vineland. Um, it's a great place to start. We're trying to expand this data. So we have um, five groups actually is what I'm gonna be kind of talking to you about. Um, and with kind of the Vineland plus neuropsych scores, plus as um, Megan just described the CCSA. So I feel like we're able to really look in a lot of different places to like about the same question. So my hope is that we're really trying to like get the most accurate information we can because we're looking so many different places asking the same questions. And so next is um, our data. I know it's a like busy slide and I had to fight with Excel for a while, but um, eventually, so this is what we got. Um, so you can see on the X axis on the left. So that's the standard score. So zero to one or zero to 100 um, really. And then on the bottom, you can see all of the, um, the parts of the Vineland. And so I tried to make things the same color. So the ABC, so the adaptive behavior composite which is just like a general composite from the Vineland is that like dark blue, yep. And then the communication score is yellow, um, activities of daily living orange. Thank you, Katie, <laughs> getting a workout. Uh, then light blue for social and um, gray for motor. So I also tried to organize this in increasing um, scores. So it kind of seems like the kids with inverted um, duplication deletion syndrome have lower scores. And then, um, but there's quite a big overlap as well. As you can see the bars, um, the, the lines kind of show the range where the X is, is the mean. Um, and so there's quite a range. So I think there's, you know, a lot more to pull out. The reason that the terminal deletion group and the mosaic ring group just look like that is because they only had one kiddo have that. So that's why that looks like that. And it's not a whole bar. The terminal deletion group also only has four bars instead of five, because for some reason we don't have a motor score um, for that kiddo, so I don't have um, that data. So this is just sort of an emerging picture of maybe deletions are, are impacting cognitive functioning more than duplications. Although I think, you know, again, kind of 10,000 foot view, we really need to like the next step would be to like quantify the size of the deletion or the duplication, right? So this is just kind of at the category level and then we'll kind of delve further um, as we go. All right, any questions? Oh, sorry, Katie. I know I was about to, but like any questions about this slide or I know it's like a lot, but, um, or I'm happy to take questions later. Um, all right, so let's keep going. <laughs> so. Um, so these are just the inverted duplication deletion syndrome um, kiddos. So I have, what's going on here is, so we have age equivalence in months on the, yep, on the left there going up. So, so months, 
And then on the bottom horizontally is, is the actual age in years of the kiddo. And then I have their Mullen scores for receptive lit communication, expressive communication, fine motor and gross motor. So, and so I felt like when I was looking at the data, you know, um, kind of like we were sort of mentioning earlier, like the scores are nice, but we're, but I feel like it's the most meaningful and relevant, the relevance to like the child's current age, right? We need that factor too, if we're not looking at a normed score, which we're not here, we're looking at just their age equivalent. So what's interesting is if you take kind of the first kiddo there, who's one years old, a lot of their scores are pretty close to their age or their actual age. So there's actually a pretty small gap in development for this kiddo. However, if you go kind of further up, you know, take the, the seven year old, like where we have seven year old, but we have scores, you know, 12 months to 18 months. So to me, that's very interesting because we're like the same diagnosis. So what is happening here? Do we have something else going on? Is this just the range because there's a lot of diversity for this genetic change? Clearly, um, we need to study this more. And there's more data that I could pull from the Mullen, but I just started with language and motor. Um, one of the um, one of the uh, scores, excuse me, on the Mullen is called the Visual Reception um, Index, and that's something that um, I feel like in working with Megan Abbott is pretty significantly affected by CBI. I don't really like that index for these kids. The visual stuff that they need to look at are these line drawings, like very small. And so I feel like that um, index is really like underrepresenting the kids' abilities, but that's probably a separate project. Um, so this was kind of um, just some somewhere to start. So but what uh, explains the M shape or is that not like significant? The M shape? Like the yeah. there? So, so yeah. that just so no, it's not really. It's just that that kiddo who is six years old scores are like 22 to 27 months. Like he just kind of popped this. I don't actually know if it's a boy or a girl. <laughs> Their scores just sort of popped up as opposed to the other six-year-old whose scores are lower. So this is just like by, I wanted to see if we were gonna get kind of like with the Vineland, like a gradual increase. So that as kids are getting older, does that definitely mean they're acquiring, you know, a lot more skills and it's just a little bit variable. Right, so I mean, there's no significance to the fact that the, all of them at 10 drop down at 13, there's no puberty effect or is this just all noise? I don't think it's noise. I think it's what they could actually show me in the moment. I see. Um, I don't, I, I, but it's not like a, um, I don't, it, I'm not, ex since this is just like the ages of the, I don't have anybody that's older than 13 to plot right now. So I don't know kind of how they would do, but I think what it says to me is that you know, age is somewhat of a predictor of how kids can do, um, but kind of not always. I'm very interested in like what this one-year-old, what this one-year-old is doing. And then, you know, I think qu asking questions of like, what therapies did kids do? When did kids get the diagnosis? Did they have seizures? What's the size of, you know, each part of their genetic change? And is that what's actually like modifying their progress? Um, so yeah, so I don't think like if I had a kiddo who was 15, it would necessarily like keep going down and might go up. <laughs> um, so it's, I think it's part of the like issue with using age equivalents like to predict, but I feel like if we just, we need to just kind of see more kids and kind of see what they're all doing. Um, um, but, Andrea, you guys have seen kids older than 13. Is it just because they haven't actually been seen by you? Yes, yeah, sorry, I should say. So we talked about how we've seen 30 kids in clinic, but I've not seen that many for neuropsych testing, correct? Yeah, we've seen um, quite a few older kiddos just having elder, older participants, <laughs> older individuals uh, who I just haven't made it for neuropsych testing yet. But yeah, we do have other data, just not this neuropsych data. Would the tools that you use then be different? for them? Um, 
I mean, they would still, I would still have them fill out the Vineland and then, you know, I don't know. I, I just try to like have my tools available to me and then like give what is like the right one to measure where that person is. Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't necessarily, I mean, I would never like force a mullin if that's not where we are developmentally. Um, so I would just sort of like try to pick going up. Um, but for, I mean, in a, I mean, in a lot of ways, I, I have confidence that the tool will, will still tell us what we want it to tell us. Maybe not for every kiddo, but I think it's worth a try. Thanks. Yeah, sure. Um, all right. So we can kind of, uh, so this is a kiddo or, um, who, or kiddo. I keep saying that, yeah. 18 year old with a uh, terminal deletion only. And so what I have graphed here, so again, we have age equivalents, but they're in years on the left. And then I actually felt like, um, so the, the Wyatt is a measure of academic skills. So Wyatt word reading, Wyatt spelling, Wyatt math problem solving. And then the EBT is expressive naming and the PBBT is receptive, um, like uh, receptive naming. So they just have to point versus the EBT, they have to say. So the EBT and the PBT kind of map onto Mullen expressive, Mullen receptive. But then um, this kiddo could actually do kind of kindergarten level-ish like work in terms of um, academics. And so that's that's like um, why I have, you know, the age equivalents are more like six years old. So quite a, quite a bit more that this um, individual was able to show us. Still a large gap, but you know, quite a bit there. So this is a, a student who, you know, they should be working on like pre preschool and kindergarten like level skills. Um, you know, so this was quite a quite a difference compared to some of the um, abilities by the um, some of the other kids that we saw. Can I ask a real quick question? Yeah, Can I sure. ask whether or not you sort of are also able to look at the school reports, you know, to see how what if you're seeing in clinic actually ties in with what they're doing in the classroom. You know, because yeah, so you know, if I put Madison with a stranger, if she wants to show off, oh, she'll give you a good show. And if she <laughs> yeah. doesn't, you know, she will she will bomb any test you give her just for the sake of to get out of the room. You know, so, yeah, it can definitely be some motivating things. Yeah. And we try to, so yeah, we do read the IEP usually mm -hmm. beforehand. If there's any sort of kind of documentation like that, I have parents like bring that or bring a progress note. Um, I usually also read any other, any, any other like medical notes that talk about like things that worked well or things that didn't work well. I mean, at this point we're used to, working hard to figure out what will get a kiddo to show us what they know. And I would say we have a pretty good rate, like not a hundred percent, not all the time. Do the kids want to play with what I have? But sometimes I just wonder if it's something else getting in the way or that I've got it wrong, you know, and I need to switch gears, you mm -hmm. know? So, um, so we do try to take in, yeah, information from the school where possible. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. All right, next one I have. Um, so duplication only, two kids. So again, so now we're down uh, back to age equivalents in months on the left there, back to Mullen scores. The blue line, dark blue line is a child who is one years old and the yellow line is a child who is three years old. So again, um, we have gaps, but a smaller gap for the one-year-old, surprisingly, kind of than the three-year-old. So is that showing me, um, again, these are different kids, so we wouldn't be able to, to speak to traject individual trajectories, but, you know, you sort of wonder if skills are, if development is, not that kids are losing skills, but are kids slowing in their trajectory? trajectory or was there a lot of illness were there seizures like what else is going on here that might again explain this gap but we don't have here this kiddo's fine motor skills are for the um, one-year-old are like right on track you know so expressive language is lower which I think we are going to see as a common pattern in 8p change but you know, some things are, are right there. So I think it's exciting to be able to tap into that. That's a great way to, if we know like fine motor skills are a strength, 
that's a, that's a great way to like work on something that's hard because as a break, you can tap into like a fine motor task that the kiddo might find fun. So, um, so this was our, so only two kids, you know, with the duplication, sorry, <laughs> thanks. Now I have, yep, two kids with the, um, you can go ahead, go forward to the, just deletion only. And so here we have um, three, three individuals. So I guess I do have this, a, a 27 year old um, on here. So, so deletion, again, need to look at probably size of deletion, but the, you know, gaps still, we have aging years on the left. Um, but the six-year-old and 12-year-old were able to do um, a measure called the WIPSI, which starts at age um, either two and a half or four, kind of depending on the one that you use. And so, again, we have skills, you know, outside of the, the Mullen range, but for one individual, we didn't. But so you have to wonder if the older individual maybe wasn't you know, 27 years. So I don't know when their diagnosis was made or if there was just the same emphasis on therapies and things like that. So, um, so an interesting kind of spread here. And then, yeah, our last um, child who's 32 months old with this mosaic ring, um, age and months on the left. And so some skills are again like pretty close to where we should be 27 months for fine motor receptive language um expressive language a little bit lower and i think this kiddo might have had other reasons for gross motor being being lower like they had some medical things that prevented them from really like working on gross motor stuff um but but anyway you know so not a huge gap here at this point either but definitely uh, the beginning of a gap. And so, you know, um, supporting, like getting involved in therapies as, as much as possible, or potentially tweaking certain therapies, you know, talking about why, what about gross motor? And because there's only so many hours in the day, as we know, and we can't work on everything all the time. And so it's kind of interesting, I think, to think about the developmental profile kind of steering participation in therapies and stuff like that. So, and I think... Oh yeah, so I don't know. I, I feel like I should sort of halt for time since we're at 2021 here. I just, um, I guess the one thing that I'll just say that I'm running into for the data in order to have like all of it for you, like at the same time, it's just hard to get it on the same scale because I have some norm scores and some age equivalents. And so to talk, to think about like how to visually show that, I need to, to I need to work on that. So I will <laughs> try to maybe find some additional like software or something that can just really be a little bit more sophisticated, um, especially as we start to see kids, you know, the same kids over and over. So we can actually kind of get some trajectories. So what I'm trying to, and, when, and another reason that this is an issue for me is that for some of the tests that I do, all I get is a less than number. So like the third bullet there. So a measure will just say like less than three. And so is that three? Like, is that two years, nine? Like, I don't know what that means. Uh, and so I don't think it's fair to, I don't think it means the child is at three, but I also don't know where to put them. And I don't want to like not use the data. So, but that's just like one, um, one problem that kind of affects some of the reporting of the results, but Luckily, um, we don't have that for all of our measures, so I'm not stuck everywhere. Um, and then, so yeah, just kind of saying that it's important to, it's important, to, it's really important in addition to my testing to get the parent report, because I feel like you really should not interpret one without the other. Um, and so again, combining the violin and with the CCSA and things like that, I think is really critical to really understand where this child is functioning. And then, I just, some ideas for like some future work, um, which I think I've kind of already said. So then I think it's just the, and this is the last one, Katie, even though I have some extra slides lingering there, just leave it. Um, Bina, I saw the, the new website. Wow, it looks great. <laughs> uh, that was a labor of love. From I bet. 
I really like the organization though. And a lot of the pictures I think will be really useful for families. So anyway, I, I snapped the new like project eight feet. It was just like, I had a different one where it was more like vertical and that was horizontal. So. <laughs> no, thank you. Um, we're really hoping that um, with, you know, the Colorado team's um, efforts here and really getting to know this population that we can then launch um, this year uh, on our website for the families and all providers, some sort of like navigator tool. So pro providers are diagnosing one child in some remote part of the world mm -hmm. um, could get a better understanding of how to, you know, offer some guidance. Um, and then also for families that are getting diagnosed at all ages now, I mean, Katie's actually, Katie Severson on the call is our patient engagement manager really working on this full time. And so almost every week, Katie, there's like a new family being diagnosed. So um, where, you know, and we're kind of looking at those numbers too, where we're starting to see some really interesting mutations coupled with just the 8P. And, and so um, she's enrolling um, so many families, which is really nice. Yeah, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. I hope we can tackle the travel, the travel issue. <laughs> for some families. So we have about five minutes left for q and I can get things started. So everyone's commenting on the variability of presentation. Maybe if we, if we think about seizure frequency, um, I guess given the lower overall seizure frequency in AP compared to other neurodevelopmental disorders, given that there isn't an obvious genotype phenotype relationship based on AP breakpoints, does one therefore have to conclude that seizures are being driven by a, a, a locus outside of AP, a modifier outside of AP, or is that not a fair conclusion to draw at this juncture? I think it's hard. Hi, this is Marguerite assigned with all of the connection issues. So thanks to everybody for your patience. Um, your geneticist in the group. The way I would answer that is think about it. If we have 22,000 genes and the scientific community understands 8,000 of them, plus we know that those 22,000 interact with each other to make over a million proteins. And your DNA can have additional modifications like throwing sugars and methyl groups and all that sort of stuff. Modifiers are not out of the question. And the other part that comes to mind is like, what is the clinical significance? What does their MRI look like? What is their past medical history? Did they previously have something like a meningitis or something else that might raise their seizure risk. So excellent question. And I always think your DNA can do lots of interesting things. Great. Anyone else with questions? So I had a I had a terribly ignorant question and maybe you can just educate me on this. Um I you know, for for the scientists on the call, more so than for the parents, of course, who really know their kids, um, it's hard to imagine uh, kind of like what um, what these kids are, you know, really getting from their environment, for example, when they're learning like a new skill. And it was really um, face question and the discussion about the 18 year old that brought me to, to that question. So. Um, the kids that are a little bit older, that are above six, um, if they did have, if if they are, um, you know, if if we're talking about kids without HP, neurotypical kids, if they had attention deficit or ADHD, they would be in some cases considered for some medication. Um, our our attention deficit, because specifically what it was was Faye asked, like, saying that. When her daughter wants to, then she can put on a show, right? So if there's stimulation, then things might work a little bit differently, and and that's and that's similar to 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 ADD and ADHD, right? So, um, have has it had, in your cohort are there kids that have been considered or have tried these medications? As I'm the sort of the starting point of this here, and I'll I'll start with the answer. I can say that. Um, Madison was put on amitriptyline for uh, cyclic vomiting syndrome, but like that's the only sort of neuromed that she's on. Otherwise, she's just on a for her reflux. Um, but 
with her, it's really, it's all about motivation. And, you know, if she's motivated to do something, by God, she'll do it, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so it's, I've forgotten the other word you used there, but it, it wasn't that, it's motivation for her. Um, and it, it has to come from her and then she will, she's very determined, incredibly determined. Um, I, what, what I, what I guess I will say is, I mean, I'm always looking for ADHD. It's part of what I'm looking for as part of my evaluation, uh, to make a diagnosis of that. There needs to be difficulties in attention over and above what we'd expect for developmental level. Um, but I mean, we also, you know, so diagnosis or not though, I know that we talk often as a team, if we feel like trying that medication would be useful, I would probably have to turf it to somebody in our group who prescribes. I know that I am bringing up, you know, those concerns, like there's definitely, you know, um, hyperactivity or inattention that would merit discussion. Um, offhand, I... Offhand, I'm not sure if I know if any of our kids have tried like a Ritalin though. Mm -hmm. Thoughts? I, I could jump in a little on this. Just it, we we also have a developmental pediatrician who sees patients within our clinic who's not on the call today. Um, but we really are trying to bring several different perspectives of specialists to the clinic so that we can get at those kinds of issues. And they're not always easy. It's not always straightforward to sort of say, well, there's some attentional challenges. Are, is that out of proportion to the developmental level or not? Would they benefit from a medication? And sometimes we're left with the option of, well, let's give it a shot and see how it goes. Um, I don't think we've pulled that data, but we ought to have that data. We, yeah. we, we should easily be able to say who has been or has not been prescribed, um, either typical or in some cases we utilize some atypical medications for ADHD. Um, so, so that's definitely something we can uh, try to pull together. And I can tell you, I'm pretty confident that at least some patients have, yes, though I couldn't give you a, a proportion. Yeah, I mean, we want to, I mean, even if like, you know, technically, whatever, it's hard to make a call for the diagnosis, it doesn't mean that you can't do a trial of, of it, you know, with your, with your pediatrician or whomever is prescribing. Because we definitely, as a clinic, want to like remove all barriers to experiencing the world. <laughs> so, you know, we want to try to make those connections to anything that we think that could help. So that's something that we definitely discuss. And so I'm sorry, I don't uh, have those numbers, but it's a great idea. Um, I know we're over time, but I'm Megan Scott. There's a question about CBI in the chat. And while you guys are looking at that, I was just kind of Here's my disclaimer. I was Googling CVI, not as if I don't Google everything, but um, this was interesting to me. Parents are most dis disturbed with CVI by the child's lack of social gaze and direct eye contact, active avoidance or withdrawal from unfamiliar visual stimulation, including people's faces is frequently reported. That's surprising to me with our population. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Should I just not be Googling? To Google whatever you want, um, but with caution. Uh, so um, Scott can take this too. But um, I was going to say that I, I think it gets back to, you know, sometimes kids with CVI are looking out of their periphery, right, at objects, at things. They're not giving central eye contact. But I mean, I think in visits with um, our 8P kiddos, I've definitely seen, you know, direct social engagement eye contact. So I, I don't think that's necessarily like you can have that and still have a diagnosis of CVI is what I mean. Uh, but I think with kids with severe CVI, certainly like direct eye contact and looking at people's faces could be a challenge. And I could see where that would be difficult as a parent as well. Um, Thank you. Can I yeah, ask, sorry, off the back of that, I, I had written it down to ask you as well, is do you know what it is, why they use the periphery? Because I see this with Matt, she's always using the periphery. And we're actually, um, I'm talking to uh, her her eye doctor on Thursday about this. They've done the sort of CVI test and they said, no, she doesn't have it. But the only way we can say one way or another is if she has an MRI, which we're not gonna do, right? Cause we don't wanna knock her out again. Um, so, so yeah, but like, what what is it about the periphery? Cause you know, I mean, and this is a child who has absolutely no problem with uh, eye contact. 
like does nothing but engage in eye contact. But if she wants to pick something up, there's no way she'll look at it. And even when she's reading, like, you know, quite often I find if I hold the book low, like she's, you know, she's using periphery to look, to read. She's not, she's not, if I put it in front, it's harder for her. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's tough. <laughs> um, so there's a couple of pieces uh, of, of all of that that are intersecting. One is just your level of social engagement and our observation if you had to take AP as a whole is that it's actually a very high level of social engagement for most of these kiddos. They're almost sort of hyper social in some cases. They're like very much in your face of strangers and very loving and sweet and wonderful uh, to interact with. So there's that strong social connectivity element um, and so we do see a strong eye contact, but when you're looking at other aspects as you're describing of how they're utilizing their vision functionally in other settings, non-social settings, there may be challenges. Similarly, we have other patients who we don't think have CVI, but have significant autistic features where social engagement is a challenge. So they don't ever make eye contact, but they actually don't have CVI, mm -hmm. right? So, but those things are laid on top of each other and it can frankly, make it challenging in terms of trying to make that diagnosis. And I'll just tell you like straight off, this is a spot we're failing you as a community, as a community of providers and physicians, we are failing the world right now on CBI diagnosis. Ophthalmologists point at neurologists, neurologists point at ophthalmologists. There is no concrete single test. You cannot do an MRI and diagnose CVI. You cannot do a visual of a potential and diagnose CVI. You cannot put somebody in front of one iPad and do some sort of assessment of their visual function and make a diagnosis. It's a combination of history, of exam features, of ruling out certain things, and you put all of that together. And that's why our test that we look at for CVI gives us a score that says, oh, there's some symptoms here, but we don't actually diagnose everybody with that particularly when they're on that more mild side. So some features that could be CVI can also be explained by other things that are going on, like attention, like autistic uh, lack of social reciprocity. And in other cases, it really is the CVI that we think that's driving it. And so it, you know, it makes it difficult. And I'll just, I'll tell you, like, it, it's something we need to do better at as a community. And, and that's one of the reasons we're trying to get the word out, publish about this. I've given numerous talks in the last year about it. I try to educate my colleagues, but it's a struggle. Well, I thank you. <laughs> that's great. And I'll, I'll feedback when we get on in London. But um, yeah, like, so do you have any understanding of, of like, what is it about the periphery that makes it easier for them to see? that's what I'm really just curious. We, we don't fundamentally know the answer to that. Oh, yeah. Part of what we think about is that one in CVI, certain visual fields may have maybe a strength compared to other ones. So we actually use those. Similarly, there may be less value in the central vision compared to the peripheral vision. So for, for many of us with normal visual processing, when I look at something, you know, I've got, 4k vision in my central and as soon as i move out of my central this is like 1920s television <laughs> like it, it i lose a lot of uh perception ability very quickly outside of my central vision so most of us are highly dependent on utilizing central visual fields for interacting with our environment if that field is not as strong then you are more willing to use peripheral vision uh, as part of your engagement with, you know, your surroundings. And so that may be part of it, but I don't actually know what any of these kids are seeing, what, like what, what they are perceiving. And, and often we don't really have the ability to ask them that. So I think it's challenging to know for sure. Yeah. I think it's, it'd be really interesting to sort of, you know, find out more about the neurological processing, you know, obviously, you know, and, and I'm wondering if AP will be able to inform that in many, many years to come. Anyway, sorry, I've taken you away. Yeah. I, can I just throw in one thing? I mean, literally, we've been to every visual specialist for Theo, um, and he throws a fit every time they try to assess him. But I will say that at almost 10, he's finally engaging with his AAC device. He kind of started last 
spring. So, and he's had this peripheral vision. And like I said, everyone's tried to assess him everywhere, um, including his PT with the walking situation. And um, so it is kind of seems to be stabilizing a little bit here, um, at least with the AAC device. That's great. And I'm sorry you haven't been able to get a diagnosis. Like Scott said, this has been a challenge in the field in general. We're we're trying to make it a priority of the clinic to look at this and um, give diagnosis out if we think it's appropriate and we can. We have yeah. a family to say that because of what we've been talking about and the Colorado team has been really like educating our families that um, was able to get a CBI diagnosis finally. And it really helped them with their services and the, the you know the things they needed. So we're, we're I wanted to add, sorry. <laughs> um, I just wanted to add, um, since my daughter Riley has had her um AAC device, she uses a Toby Dynavox eye gaze. Um, and she was the same, would never look at directly at you, eye contact was extremely reduced and now that she's had it I feel like her eye contact is so much better um because she knows you know if she focuses on something she gets a result so even when she's just looking at me you know and directing her questions at me um she's very so much more engaged now that we have that device so I think that could probably help too and I hope you know more families look into that specific device with the eye gaze if they're not getting results um, through other devices. So I, I think you both raise a really good point that people sometimes think that if there's visual impairment, you can't use an eye gaze device. And that's absolutely not true. Right. Um, and, and so I think that's a, a, an important observation that you both pointed to. And I think that you're right that at the end of the day, there's a fundamentally learning is is cause and effect, right? And if we are presenting visual stimuli to individuals with CVI in a way that makes it hard for them to be consistent about what they're seeing and interpreting that, then they're not going to get good cause and effect because you don't have, you have noise in the system. If you can prevent, present things to them in a way that they can consistently see and learn those associations, then you're going to start to get much better engagement over time and that learning can really flourish. And so that's a big part of what we, we try to talk about in, in our clinic in terms of how do you compensate for or uh, adjust to a diagnosis of CVI. Well, on that, let's wrap. Uh, I think, thank you everybody for uh, stellar engagement. And this was a great kickoff to the 2024 roundtable series and look forward to seeing you again next month and round of applause to the, the Children's Hospital of Colorado team for a wonderful um, multi-speaker presentation. Yeah, thank you all so much. We're so grateful to have all of you. Um, you're our only amazing clinical team and um, you know, really for such a rare disease like um, that really sits in isolation, it means a lot to us and just showing up. So um, I'm touched today and every day by all of your um, faith and support in our community. Thanks, everyone. Have a great rest of your day and rest of your week. Thanks, Thank you, everyone. Bye.